I'm a big fan of coffee and caffeine. And I've been, especially in the last few days, consuming a very large amount. And I'm cognizant of the fact that um, my body is affected by caffeine different than the anecdotal information that other people tell me. I seem to be not at all affected by it. It's almost, um, it, it feels like more like a ritual than it is a, a chemical boost to my performance. Like I can drink several cups of coffee right before bed and just knock out anyway. I'm not sure if it's a biological chemical or it has to do with just the fact that I'm cons consuming huge amounts of caffeine. All that to say, uh, what do you think is the relationship between coffee and sleep, caffeine and sleep? If there's an interesting distinction there. There is a distinction. So I think the first thing to say, which is going to sound strange coming from me, is drink coffee. <laughs> um, the health benefits associated with drinking coffee are really quite well established now. Um, but I think that the counterpoint to that, well, firstly, the dose and the timing make the poison. And I'll perhaps <laughs> come back to that in yes. just a second. But for coffee, it's actually not the caffeine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people have asked me about this rightful paradox between the fact that sleep provides all of these incredible health benefits and then coffee, which can have a deleterious impact on your sleep, has <laughs> a whole collection of health benefits, many of them Venn diagram overlapping with those that sleep provides. How on earth can you reconcile those two? And the answer is that, well, the answer is very simple. It's called antioxidants. That it turns out that for most people in Western civilization, because of diet not being quite what it should be, the major source through which they obtain antioxidants is the coffee bean. So the, the humble coffee bean has now been asked to carry the astronomical weight of serving up the large majority of people's antioxidant needs. Mm -hmm. And you can see this if, for example, you look at the health benefits of decaffeinated coffee. It has a whole constellation of really great health benefits too. So it's not the caffeine, and that's why I liked what you said, mm -hmm. this sort of separation of church and state between coffee <laughs> and caffeine. It's not the caffeine, it's the coffee bean itself that provides those health benefits. But coming back to how it impacts sleep, it impacts sleep in probably at least three different ways. The first is that for most people, caffeine can make it obviously a little harder to fall asleep. Caffeine can make it harder to stay asleep. But let's say that you are one of those individuals, and I think you are, and you can say, look, I can have three or four espressos with dinner and I fall asleep just fine and I stay asleep soundly across the night. So there's no problem. The downside there is that even if that is true, the amount of deep sleep that you get will not be as deep. And so you will actually lose somewhere between 10 to 30% of your deep sleep if you drink caffeine in the evening. Mm -hmm. So to give you some context to to drop your deep sleep by, let's say 20%, I'd probably have to age you by 15 years, or you could do it every night with a cup of coffee. I think the fourth component that is perhaps less well understood about coffee is its timing. And that's why I was saying the timing and the dose make the poison. Mm -hmm. The dose, by the way, once you get past about three cups of coffee a day, the health benefits actually start to turn down in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So there is a U-shaped function. It's sort of, uh, you know, the Goldilocks syndrome, not mm -hmm. too little, not too much, just the right amount. The second component is the timing though. Caffeine has a half-life of about um, five to six hours, meaning that after five to six hours, 50% of that on average for the average adult is still in the system, which means that it has a quarter life of 10 to 12 hours. So in other words, if you have a coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating in your brain at midnight. So having a cup of coffee at noon, one could argue is the equivalent of tucking yourself into bed at midnight. And before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of coffee. But that doesn't still answer your question as to why are you so immune? So I'm someone who is actually unfortunately very sensitive to caffeine. And if I have, you know, even two cups of coffee in the morning, um, I, I don't sleep as well that night. And I, 
find it miserable because I love the smell of coffee. I love the routine. I love the ritual. I think I would love to be invested in it. It's just terrible for my sleep. So I switched to decaf. There is a difference from one individual to the next, and it's controlled by a set of liver enzymes called cytochrome P450 enzymes. And there is a particular gene that if you have a different sort of version of this gene, it's called CYP1A2. That gene will determine the speed of the clearance of caffeine from your system. Mm -hmm. Some people will have a version of that gene that is very effective and efficient at clearing that caffeine. And so their half-life could be as short as two hours rather than five to six hours. Other people, uh, hands up Matt Walker, um, have a version of that gene that is not very effective at clearing out the uh, the caffeine. And therefore their half-life sort of sensitivity could be somewhere between you know eight to nine hours. Mm. So we understand that there are individual differences, but overall, I guess the, the top line here is drink coffee um, and understand that it's not the caffeine, it's the coffee that's the benefit and the dose makes the poison. Is there some aspect to it that's, it's like a muscle in terms of the, all the combination of letters and numbers mm -hmm. that you just said, is there some aspect that if um, I can improve the quarter life, the half life, could decrease that number if I just practice? <laughs> like I drink a lot of coffee, so, so like habit yeah. uh, uh, alters how your body is able to get rid of the caffeine not how the body is able to get rid of the caffeine, but it does alter how sensitive the body is to the caffeine. And it's not at the level of the enzyme degrading the caffeine. It's at the level of the receptors that caffeine will act upon. Mm. Now, it turns out that those are called adenosine receptors, and maybe we can speak about what adenosine is and sleep pressure and all of that good stuff. But as you start to drink more and more coffee, um, the body tries to fight back. And it happens with many different drugs, by the way, and it's called tolerance. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that your body becomes tolerant to a drug is that the receptors that the drug is binding to, these sort of welcome sites, these sort of you know pitcher mitts, um, as it were, that receive the drug, those start to get taken away from the surface of the cell. And it's what we call receptor internalization. So the cell starts to think, gee whiz, you know, there's, there's a lot of stimulation going on. This is too much. So I'm just going to, when normally I would, you know, coat my cell with, let's just say five of these receptors for argument's sake, things are going a little bit too ballistic right now. I'm going to take away at least two of those receptors and downscale it to just having three of those. And now you need two cups of coffee to get the same effect that one cup of coffee got you before. And that's why then when you go cold turkey on coffee, all of a sudden the system has equilibriated itself to expecting X amount of stimulation. And now all of that stimulation is gone. So it's now got too few receptors mm -hmm. and you have a caffeine withdrawal syndrome. And that's why, for example, with you know drugs of abuse, things like heroin, when people go into abstinence, you know, as they're sort of moving into their addiction, they will build up a, a progressive tolerance to that drug. So they need to take more of it to get the same high. Mm -hmm. But then if they go cold turkey for some period of time, the system goes back to being more sensitive again. It starts to repopulate the surface of the cell with these receptors. Mm -hmm. But now when they reuse and they fall off the wagon, if they go back to the same dose that they were using before, you know, 10 weeks ago or three months ago, that dose can kill them. They can have an overdose. Mm -hmm. Even though they were using the same amount at those two different times, the difference is that it's not the dose of the drug, it's the sensitivity of the system. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that we see with caffeine. In terms of training the muscle, as it were, is the system becomes less sensitive, can calibrate. Is there a time the number of hours before bed, that's a, a safe bet to, to most people to recommend you shouldn't drink caffeine this many hours. Like, is there an average half-life that you should be aiming at? Yeah. Uh, or is this advice 
kind of impossible because there's so much variability. There is huge variability. And I think everyone themselves, you know, to a degree knows it. Although I'll put a caveat on that too, because it's a slightly dangerous point. So the recommendation for the average adult and who, where is the average adult in society? There is no such thing, but for the average adult, it would be probably cutting yourself off maybe 10 hours you know, before. So assuming a normative bedtime in society, I would say, try to stop drinking caffeine, you know, before 2 p.m. and um, just keep an eye out, you know, and if you're struggling with sleep, dial down the caffeine and see if it makes a difference.